Hello everyone, my name is Carl and a lot of you guys probably know me from uh, Facebook pages, not so much on the forums and maybe my drive tribe. Anyways, um, Ryan, Matthew and I are kind of getting together to hopefully educate you guys with tuning your cars a little bit more or maybe just understanding the tune that's on them. So um, I guess I'm taking over kind of the data logging aspect of it. Um, if you guys aren't aware, you should definitely check out my drive tribe. I have some what I consider pretty good content to kind of get you up to speed on the basic components of how to read a data log, how to digest that information, how to process it. Um, but I know that not everyone likes reading. A lot of you guys like watching videos too, and that's another great way to learn. So today is kind of going to be an opportunity to kind of learn the same stuff that's in those articles about how to read your data logs, but to do that um, basically using uh, with a video as the tool, as the medium. So I, what I have pulled up in front of me is just um, a Eurodyne data log. It is from basically some of the protein that I've done. It's not particularly important today, but we'll kind of walk through and you'll kind of walk through with me because I even don't know what um, is in this data log. Um, I have it labeled as third gear, 87 octane, 20 PSI, et cetera, et cetera. But we'll figure out you know, what's going on here, what's good, what's bad what we might want to change. And this is kind of going to give you guys an opportunity to, I think, learn about kind of what we do as, you know, maybe more advanced people in the community when we kind of look at tuning our cars and look at understanding what's going on with the tunes. So let's get started here. So I'm going to blow this up a little bit to hopefully make it a little more readable. So the first thing when you open up your data log is you get this in Excel or Google Sheets or whatever. Um, is you're going to end up with this huge spreadsheet of data that looks pretty, you know, overwhelming at first is the best way that I can really put it. But so I'm just going to walk through it as if you've never seen one of these at all. So basically this top row here is all the different variables that we're capturing. Hopefully if you are logging with Eurodyne, you just selected all variables to make it easy. The new high speed logger is great. So you can get data really rapidly. So there's no reason why you shouldn't be capturing all variables. Um, and then basically every row going across is one data point. So at one time we went into the ECU, we basically read all those variables and we stored them on a file. And that's kind of what we're reading here. And we're going to kind of walk through basically what each of these mean and, um, you know, what kind of we might be looking for when we want to talk about tuning the car or adjusting it and things like that. All right, so the first thing is time. That's pretty self-explanatory. We already covered that. Engine speed or RPM. Um, now we start getting into the more complicated stuff. So air mass. So I'll probably be coming back to these as we go, but I'll try to explain a little bit also along the way. So air mass is actually air mass per stroke. So this is basically in kind of one revolution of your piston how much air is that is one cylinder taking in and the way that we measure that is actually in milligrams of air so the weight of the air per stroke um, this would be a super awesome way to give us really good data unfortunately the sensor only reads up to a maximum value of i believe 1390 so if you ever get to a car where you're making a lot of power you'll quickly exceed this value and this kind of data point becomes not very useful which is unfortunate moving on we have pressure before throttle set point and pressure upstream throttle. So these are two really weird names. Not sure why Eurodyne decided to do that. Um, thanks, Chris Tapp. But basically, um, pressure before set point is basically what well, you can think of this as boost target. So that's kind of what the ECU is saying. Hey, we want to try to hit this ECU. Pressure upstream throttle is basically boost actual. So that's saying, all right, this is how this is what we requested. This is what we actually got. The next thing that we have is position of boost pressure actuator. So this variable here is basically your wastegate. So the wastegate is essentially what controls how hard your turbo is working. So when this is at a very low value, like zero or close to zero, then the wastegate is completely closed. That means all the air that could possibly be pushed through your turbo is being pushed through your turbo. Um, when it is 100% open, that means that no air is flowing through the turbo at all. And, uh, or as little as possible, I should say, not no air. It's being bypassed, and we would, might do that if we're um, uh, lifting off the throttle or you know maybe we've overboosted, something like that. 
Um, the next one is position set point for boost pressure actuator. This is basically, I don't know what's the best way I can explain this. This is kind of like a target from the, e from the ECU of where it thinks this pressure actuator should need to be to, uh, um, to hit boost versus where it actually is. For the most part, you can ignore this column. It's not particularly important unless you have some advanced issue that you're trying to diagnose. Um, the next pressure or next column we have is ambient air pressure. So this column is going to be useful particularly for guys that are not at sea level. Um, this can help us really understand some of the maps like max pressure ratio. Um, the next column is intake air temperature. <laughs> right now this does not work so you can just straight up ignore this column. It does not matter. Uh, the next column we have here is lambda value and lambda set point. So this is the same thing. The actual is the value and the set point is the target. So lambda um, is basically the term that we use for air fuel ratio. And kind of without getting into too much detail, because this does get pretty complex pretty fast. Um, lambda... Lambda is normalized to whatever kind of fuel you're running. So kind of what that means is if we were to run straight ethanol, it turns out that we'd need a lot more fuel. We'd actually need um, only nine parts of air to one part fuel if we were running 100% ethanol. Um, however, if we were running straight gasoline, no ethanol, we'd need 14.7 parts of air. So much more air for your one part of fuel, the same amount of fuel. So lambda is nice because it is normalized to this ratio, whereas air-fuel ratio is not. Um, and maybe that was a little bit complicated, but when we circle back around to talking about these individually, I think they'll make a lot more sense. Uh, the next thing is lambda controller output. Um, this is, to my understanding, and again, I'm pretty new to these updated logs, but this is kind of like your fuel trims. Does that mean that um, we've been running too rich or too lean, and we're trying to correct one way or the other. Um, the next thing is fuel rail pressure. So fuel rail pressure, um, this is particularly useful if you're getting close to maxing out the fuel system. You will notice that your fuel pressure starts dropping, um, and we'll go into that in more detail, but this is a good tool to let us know when we're getting the limits of the hardware. Actual gear, pretty self-explanatory. Um, injector pulse width. So injector pulse width is also kind of like fuel rail pressure. It lets us know how close we are to basically maxing out the fuel system. And if we want to get really intensive in the math, we can do a lot of cool stuff with injector pulse width as well. Ignition timing cylinder one. So this is basically timing advancement. So timing advancement is measured in degrees, um, basically when the spark plug actually fires versus top dead center of the piston. So in the, this first cell, for instance, we have 18. So that, what that means is if we were to look at basically the piston being at top dead center and we'd have kind of the crank down here, um, the crank is 18 degrees off of top dead center when the spark plug actually fired. And at first glance, you might say, well, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to fire before? Well, what happens is because there's basically room between the piston and the top of the cylinder, that it actually takes time for the flame to burn all the air. So the reason why we would do it down or beforehand is when, as by the time that the piston has reached the top, we hopefully have burned everything. And which means that pressures are at a maximum because now we have all this heat, all this energy that wants to be or wants to expand. So if the pressure is highest at the top, then it puts the strongest force on basically pushing that piston down. So this is why timing advancement helps us make power. Now the next th uh, four columns are knock retardation. So essentially, what this means is if we, like we said, we wanted to make sure that we have that maximum pressure at the top. Now, what you can imagine happening is if we start this flame front too early and we start burning that fuel too early, we actually end up inducing another explosion. And what happens when we have two kind of separate flame fronts, as they're called, we get what's called knock because these two interact with each other and they literally cause um, vibrations in the engine, which can sound like a pinging, um, a metal metallic pinging sound. So... 
But the point of this is basically these the engine luckily is able to detect when this is happening and then change that ignition timing to adapt for it. So if there's no knocking, we haven't done it too early, then you'll see this value of zero, which is great. That means that our tune it matches well to our car and hopefully we're um, you know, making lots of power, but we're not causing any problems either. Uh, the next setting is the accelerator pedal position. So this is where your gas pedal actually is. Pretty self-explanatory. The next um, column is throttle angle. So you might at first say, well, Carl, what's the difference between accelerator position and throttle angle? Shouldn't they be the same? Funny you should ask. The answer is no, they should not. So why would you do that? Why would you have a different accelerator than throttle position? The answer is boost. It turns out that um, basically by changing the actual position of the throttle, we're able to get a higher manifold pressure because it's kind of still hard to flow air past the throttle and it can help with that. I don't understand all the details of that working, so I don't want to say more than that. However, generally speaking, you will only look at both of these columns to know what parts of your data log are relevant. So for, in for instance, my throttle here is not is I'm basically not on the throttle. You can see that my throttle and my accelerator are both very low, less than 20. So what does that mean? That means when I'm looking at this kind of a data log as a whole, I can look at these columns and basically say, these are not relevant, I wasn't accelerating yet. That's really what I use them for. Again, there's more advanced reasons you'd want it. That would pretty much be for um, debugging further issues. Um, the next column is actual engine torque and the torque limiter. So actual engine torque, if you've watched my um, how to make a virtual dyno video, is pretty cool because it's basically a way that the ECU kind of mimics the amount of torque and it can give us an idea about how much power we're making. Um, we've seen that as you go into higher power levels, this becomes less and less accurate, which is kind of unfortunate. But um, nevertheless, definitely gives us a good indicator to know um, if we're making power. One thing that I think is really good about it is while it may be off, we know that if we make a change to our tune and this number goes up, that we've made our car or supposedly made our car faster. We could, it gives us a good amount of confidence that we have improved something. Um, the torque limit. So this is basically a hard limit in your ECU that says the torque cannot go past this value. So this particularly um, is not an issue for most people because rarely, unless you're big turbo or something, would you hit this torque limit. Basically all of kind of even your stage one tunes bump up this torque limit um, pretty high. So you almost never have to worry about hitting it. There are some kind of extreme cases, but to be honest, if you're getting close to hitting this torque limit and you haven't built your motor, you're kind of asking for trouble because remember, torque is what kills engines. All right, so now we're almost to the end here. So the last four columns are about your adjustable file. So if you remember, the Maestro file is much like the adjustable file and basically has um, an octane setting. So what that octane setting allows us to do is basically extrapolate between two timing tables. So essentially the ECU has one timing table that is there when you have low octane fuel. So it's very conservative. It um, doesn't make necessarily a lot of power, but it keeps it safe. And there's another timing table that is very aggressive or is made for high octane, which is gonna be aggressive, made for race fuel, made for lots of power, stuff like that. And this slider basically extrapolates between these two tables. So for instance, um, what and then what this does here at the very end is basically provides us um, the lookups between the high and low octane. So interestingly, the high octane is first and then the low octane. But because in my case, um, I believe 87 was the minimum octane. And um, what am I trying to say here? Sorry. <laughs> Um, because 87 is the minimum octane, I expect my actual ignition timing to be very close to this low octane um, ignition lookup. Now, you'll find that this does not correlate perfectly, and the reason for that is our ECUs are very aggressive. And what I mean is they will pretty much try to advance timing as much as possible without getting knocked. So you can see I'm on 87, I'm on the minimum octane setting, 
the target is only 16.875, but my actual value is 18. So timing was advanced more than one degree because the ECU felt that that was safe. And this is pretty common on our cars. You'll see it go the other way as well. When you get knocked, ignition timing will go down. But I these columns will help us a lot with Maestro tuning because we have we when we go to adjust timing maps, we kind of want to say, okay, well, where... The tables can often get very complicated, and you'll say, well, actually, what am I referencing in these tables? And this gives us a good idea of what it's actually referencing, which is nice. And then the last thing is the adjustable boost limit. So one thing, if you guys don't know about our cars and the adjustable boost limit, is that it is a hard upper limit. So essentially, say you have a boost curve that looks kind of like a nice um, arc, right? Like, let's say, you know, it's low enough. Low RPMs, it builds up in the mid-range, and then tapers off. What this adjustable boost setting does is it peaks off the maximum about amount of boost you can make. So if, say, we had a curve that, you know, ramped up to 26 PSI and then slowly ramped back down to, say, tapered to 17, right? That would be what I would consider a safe boost curve for even an IS-20 car, potentially. If you have your limiter set to 17 PSI, what you're going to see happen is the car is going to ramp up to um, to basically 20 PSI of boost, and then instead of keep going up to 26, it's gonna flatline, it's gonna stay at 20 PSI. And then finally, when maybe the request goes below 20 PSI, it's gonna start tapering back off. And this adjustable boost limit can be useful because we can set it to something really low, which basically can help us when maybe we're trying to debug the tune, just make sure there's no baseline issues. But bear in mind that this is not a 100% safety net. And what I mean by that is I've seen everything from cases where the car just completely ignores this boost limit altogether. That has happened. <laughs> um, and But more commonly, the reason why I say still be careful with this is most turbo failures that I've seen on our cars happen in the higher RPMs. It's still a relatively small turbo, and when we're talking about revving past 6,000, we're pushing a lot of air through this very small turbo, relatively speaking. And even if you have maybe your adjustable boost setting to something that you feel is safe, like 22 PSI, 22 PSI at 4,500 RPM, very safe on our cars. Almost, you know, an IS, I've heard of even IS 12s running that kind of boost sometimes. But 22 PSI at 7,000, that's a really good time to, to end up blowing up a turbo. So just keep in mind that this adjustable boost setting is not something that's automatically guaranteed to keep you safe, but it can help you throughout the tuning process and it can help you depending on um, what your boost curve looks like. So we'll kind of walk through all of these variables probably more individually in separate videos. So this doesn't get crazy long, but hopefully this gives you uh, an idea of what the different fields are, what we're looking at, and you feel like, all right, maybe I can sort of do something with this.